Hi, everyone. In episode three of the Trader Development Podcast, I'm interviewing Ali Afshari. He is the CEO and co-founder of Advanced Technical Methods, which is a quant uh, investing firm in Toronto, Canada. Some of you may know his work from his contributions on the BTC blog. He just recently posted the article about how to master price action, which is why I reached out. Um, what many people don't know is that he actually partnered with Al Brooks and Richard to create the Brooks trading course that we now see on the BTC website. He managed the content, he edited the slides, he helped Al make it so that it's as easily digestible as possible for us um, who are learning from the course. He has a master's in education, so he understands how people learn and how to learn effectively. So um, just a wealth of knowledge, uh, an amazing conversation. I was inspired by it. Um, I knew that he understood how to learn how to trade, um, but just seeing his slides, his detailed notes, his his flow charts, uh, it just inspired me and let me know that there's still a lot of work to be done and there's a lot more that I could do to, to get to where I want to be. So um, I tried my best to ask good questions. Uh, his answers were based on what I was asking. So I tried my best to guide the conversation in a way that I thought would be most helpful for everyone. But I missed some questions and I maybe didn't do the best job. So if you have any questions for him, uh, please leave it in the comments. He's agreed to potentially do a part two in the future. So if there's anything he said that um, you want clarified or if you have a question of your own, please leave it in the comments and I'll forward it to him and see if we can if we can get to that in a part two. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And um, let me know in the comments what you think. Okay. Hi, Ali. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast today. Sure, no problem. Thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, I think I think it's it's always nice to hear from someone who has found success with Brooks Price Action because um, it's I think at face value it's a very difficult journey, and to find <laughs> so to find people who are on the other side of it, I think uh, is really inspiring for traders to see. So I'm, I'm really happy to have you here to share your perspective after having gone through, you said you've been trading for over 10 years, right? Uh, it's more than that right now. Yes. Yeah. So you've been trading for a long time and you've gone through all the struggles that I think most traders trading BPA will go through. So I think your perspective is going to be very valuable. Um, so to start, can you talk about how you got into trading and um, how you decided on Brooks Price, Brooks Price Action and how you found Al Brooks? Yeah, sure. So. Um... I was new in Canada back then. Um, I moved to Canada in 2006 and um, I was um, working as a network engineer at the time. Um, and one night I saw this ad on TV for a company called Invest Tools, mm -hmm. who were um, advertising their options training course and trading uh, software. So I went to their classes and signed up for that course uh, so that that's how i got started but then i began reading a lot of books i have probably read over 250 60 i don't know i just lost count there's a huge library here <laughs> with a ton of books in it and probably almost half of it half of it is electronic books like they're not physical ones so I, I read almost anything that I could fi find and interested me. Uh, then, um, so one of the books was um, Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom from Dr. Van K. Tarp. Mm -hmm. And I um, went and saw, met him in person. To, I went to North Carolina to his, uh, to his workshops and decided to sign up for his Super Trader program which was a fairly expensive program at the time. This is, uh, we're talking 2010 now, by this time. Um, I, the course, his course at that time was $50,000. Wow. Yeah. So I paid the first installment, 25K, and I joined the pro that program. And were you already trading successfully at this time or were you still in the process of learning um i, I found success happened. with invest tools and oh, yeah. with the initial you know um technical analysis whatever i knew about it right uh, but i did it very methodically i started with paper trading tried to uh, just limit myself to a set of rules and do nothing else right um and before going live i 
<clears throat> my goal was to double a trading account. Mm -hmm. So I doubled my perfect trading account uh, three times in a row in the exact same manner using the same rules. And then started trading real money, um, basically buying calls and puts, no stocks, no fancy spreads, nothing, just buying calls and puts. And day trading. Uh, not so much day trading because oh, I had okay. a day job at the time. It I was see. end of day trading. <laughs> I see. I could just look at the market maybe during the lunch time, um, mm. early morning, and then after work after five p.m. And I managed to double my account again, but this time it took longer. Mm. Uh, it took two and a half times longer than paper paper trading. And I realized that there are some psychological issues that need to be addressed there because I was following the same rules. Everything was the same. So right. why the results are different. Hmm. But I managed to do that. And this was a small trading account. Um, so when I moved to Canada, I brought with me $40,000. That was all the budget I had for immigration to Canada. I didn't want to spend a dollar more right. because I felt I'm... Um, an educated, qualified person to find a job, and mm. I was not willing to hang around and spend everything here. And I found the job within the first week. So that money was never spent. And uh, the first trading account was $30,000. That was the excess cash from <laughs> the 40,000 I brought with me. Right. And I doubled that in about four months. Wow. And this is and still then, big yeah, and then use that money as the down payment for, for this house. Oh, wow. So <laughs> I put it somewhere that I couldn't lose it anymore. Right. So going back to Dr. Tarp, uh, I joined his program in 2010 and immediately realized that these guys are not traders. They're very well-intentioned people. What they did was very valuable. Uh, but it stopped at the end of the psychology part. Um, okay. The trading part, I really didn't get anything from it. And as a result, I dropped out of that program after six months. Mm. Now, during that period, I had a lot of classmates, you know, people who were in that program. They, they were all very uh, motivated people, very educated people from all over the world. And one of those classmates actually pointed out Dr. Um, Dr. Brooks' first book. So at the time, there was only one book, the, the first book with the dark black cover. Right. Reading. Bar by bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the book that I found, and there were no courses. Right. Um, I suffered through that book. It was a very difficult read for me. Mm -hmm. And then his course came out, I think it was... 2012, the first course. The first course. So I immediately bought that and that made things a bit easier. And then by that time, he also had the three books, the three volume, you know, uh, right. set. So I bought that and started reading uh, the, those books. It took nine months to go through the first one, Trends. Trends, yeah. 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 And then things started to become easier and easier. And I guess I read the three of them cover to cover four times each. Wow. Did you go in order? Did you read trends four times until you got it down and then move on? Or did you go trends, ranges, reversals, and then restart and do all three again? I read trends two times, back to back. Hmm. Then progressed to the end. So second book and the third book. Right. And then got back to trends and started reading again hmm. and taking notes this time. And how did this so, affect your your current system, your rules based system? Did you were you tweaking it, or were you just reading to? Um, uh, no, I stopped trading at that point. But you stopped because trading. I was studying full time. I mean, full time. I mean, all the time that I had, right. and this was getting home around six from work, studying till two a.m., getting up, going back to work, and rinse and repeat every day, and weekends uh, all day long. 12 hours as long as i could hmm. so at this point you're just working and studying reading the book studying. especially i had very heavy you know responsibilities at work hmm. i was leading a 
team of IT experts. I was the senior architect for a very big project. Um, ton of responsibilities and all over the place. If you're in computer networking, you have to visit data centers. Mm -hmm. So I was also traveling uh, in Ontario and Canada for my project. So um, it was impossible to study and trade and I stopped the trading part. But I think that experience of live trading is crucial. You wouldn't find the trader that's inside you. There's a trader inside everybody and you wouldn't know who he is and what is what is his thought process, what is his traits and personality, because that trader is a completely different person than who you think you are. So understanding that person early on really will help you to um, plan for success. Mm -hmm. And so when you once you started reading Al's books and went through his course, how long did it take for you to start implementing and start seeing some success? With his methods um what it helped me to do was to structure my thinking and uh i was very fortunate to be able to speak with al at the same time after mm -hmm. i read this these books um i began trading in a very limited uh, scale as much as my time would let me do it um again this was end of day trading basically doing the same things you know there, there was no futures trading it was just buying options calls and puts and sometimes the spreads um at the end of the day near the close of the market or during the lunch time that i had some time to look at the markets right. and then holding the tr trades for you know anywhere between a day to maybe a month at most uh, like for example if you're selling your spread you wanted to get uh, collect um, data so you have to hold it for a period of time anyway um, until I finally finished that project in 2014 I really didn't have any time for day trading because of my responsibilities uh, I went to see Al in 2014 I went to Vegas met him for the first time right. and I took my trading range book with me to ask him to please kindly sign it for me yeah and he said why this one uh, i said well i couldn't bring the three of them it, there's too heavy <laughs> and i think if somebody wants to be a trader he has to know this one this is the yeah. most important one compared to reversals and trends why is that why, why is it your belief that that one is the most important for traders? well because the market spends if if you're talking about day trading and um, this is the same for higher time frames as well but if you study the day structure um 62 percent of days are in trading ranges from open to close and this is something you found from your own um yeah 86 percent of days spend at least half the day four hours three to four hours in trading ranges so we have three skills trading in trends which is basically breakouts and strong uh, moves directional moves channels uh, trying to pick tops and bottoms reversals and then trading ranges mm -hmm. so out of the three which one do you think you're going to get the most bang for your buck it's trading ranges right especially as a day trader yeah and then if you understand trading range as well you are bound to become a good reversal trader because reversals form in trading ranges so that's the critical knowledge in price action trading in my opinion at least um and it's the most difficult to master because there is a lot of nuances and you have to be able to understand all of those nuances and be able to think very quickly if you're day trading you have five seconds or less to make a decision intraday hmm. And I want to talk more about the, the nitty gritty of the trading. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Sure. Um, so you went from um, meeting Dr. Brooks, and then that's where we stopped. You met Dr. Brooks, you asked him to sign your book. And then from there, you were able to build a relationship with him moving forward. Can you talk yeah. about how you've been involved in, in what everyone sees when they, when they study Al Brooks now? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I was uh, communicating by email with Dr. Brooks before then. 
and he was very kind to to reply to my questions and i had questions man like mm. you wouldn't believe um emails that if you print it on on paper it would probably be four pages long and he would respond to all of it wow every single question and this went on for years um in 2015 when i had finally finished that uh, big project and i had my son born and i wanted to take some time off work um, I started to help Al with the new new course, the new online Brooks trading course. The one we see now. That, yeah, that, the right. one that you see now. Right. So he knew that I had a master's degree in education. So he asked me, what do you think? And I looked at some of the material that he had at the time. And this is, uh, that course was at, at that point, 40% complete. Mm -hmm. So I said, Al, you know what? You have to start from... The beginning and do it again because this is not going to cut it really and he he actually thought about it and said okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do it yeah. wow and so my argument is... was look this is your legacy mm -hmm. so leave a good legacy for everyone mm -hmm. and I'm, i i will be helping you to to do it in the best way that i can help you do it so i worked with al for probably two and a half years till mid 2017 on this course i uh, designed the the graphics of it the layout and uh, how the slides should look like and what colors to use um, all of the visual aspects of it and so your feedback for his course that was your um you're using your expertise to say is this going to be effective for students who watch your course yeah. are they going are they going to um, absorb as much material as you're intending and that's yeah. the feedback you get yeah exactly mm. and also to have to have it to have a good flow and right. be pleasant to watch and all mm. those things um richard as uh admin right. had also a huge role in the in this course because he did all the audio visual editing of the of the course mm. and he did an absolutely great job i mean um, so he, Al, and I, the three of us, worked together to to make this course happen. And um, I also proofread all the slides for him when it was finished, mm -hmm. which took about a year or so to do. Yeah, wow. it was it was quite quite a lot of work to get it done. Do you feel like you learned more about the content going through it? Yeah, because I had to read it three times. Basically, I, mm -hmm. I read it once. And then I read it as it was being produced. And then I read it for the third time when it it was done to for, for uh, proofreading. Mm. Uh, wow. And at this time I was also trading and I, I was now working as a full-time trader. So I was trading and I had um, <clears throat> a huge amount of my time dedicated to programming mm. because I realized that I have to learn it the way that I wanted to. Um, I was working with a friend of mine who is a professional programmer, 30 years of experience in programming. Mm. But then I realized that programming for trading is different from programming for business, let's say. And you have, you have to have two different skills. You have to have the skill of trading and the skill of programming for trading, plus being a software programmer. So it took a while to get the the hang of it took um, probably two or three years for me to fully understand how to code a trading system, how to write indicators well, how to do research well uh, mm -hmm. using computers. So once um, you once you started using or trading full time, then you moved on to find ways to to code and program. Um, and and what was the extent of the programming? Was it to automate the trading, or was it just to automate the things that um like automatic but still discretionary just to show you things that um like al would teach but that you would need to look for yourself well i had a long list of things that i wanted to do based on all the material i've, I've read hmm. and you know i'm an engineer so it's pretty hard to convince me if i can't prove it mathematically so i began um, programming everything that i i had read 
and and this included price action too so it took i don't know how many years but it's still ongoing so it, it it's the fun part of my work to to think about ideas and code them in a computer it's very re relaxing it's very de-stressing so i still do it but i i thoroughly researched close to 300 concepts including price action and um, ideas for developing measurement techniques because you know if you are doing systematic trading on a computer you need to be able to measure things mm -hmm. a trader a, a discretionary price action trader still measures everything but he measures it by eyeballing the charts right. and comparing it to some mental patterns but if you're doing it by computer then you have to be able to teach the computer how to measure things and um if you can do that, if you can program computers to effectively measure market action, then that deepens your own understanding of price action For sure. and how the markets work in general. Mm -hmm. Because that's like teaching a, a baby that doesn't understand anything to read the charts. That's basically what it is. So that deepens your own understanding. And if, if you find fun doing it, it's, it's really, really great. Mm -hmm. I guess. I guess it also deepens your understanding because you, as a discretionary trader, you notice something about the chart, but you can't necessarily put it into words. And Correct. as a programmer, you have to put it into words. You have exactly. to put it into code and say, this bar is this much bigger than these other bars, therefore it could be a climax or whatever. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things there is there are some times that you should be completely rigid. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I want this. And I'm not willing to compromise even one tick. Right. Okay. And then there are, there are times that you have to be able to code in such a way that the computer makes compromises. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? I mean, that was one of the things that was very interesting to me to, to be able to write programs that understand when to compromise and when not to compromise, which is exactly what a trader does, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, it, I can tell you with certainty that price action is very accurate, more accurate than, than you can think it is. Mm -hmm. Because people look at charts and say, oh, well, this is noise or, you know, this is um, different today or, you know, I'm going to buy in this area. No, no none of that. I mean, if you really understand things, um, it's very, very accurate because I've quantified it mathematically and I know for a cert certainty what probabilities are with different um, setups and different things in price action. Mm -hmm. and so, when, yeah. yeah, as I say, one of Al's, I think, something that makes him unique is that he his, his kind of what made him popular and in my mind is when where everyone else would say it's noise he would say no it's not it means something and okay. he's looking for um five tick traps and very precise things that are happening on the chart and you're saying that having been able to quantify it that the market is exact and there is a, a logic and a, a programmable language about the market that is extremely accurate is that what you're saying uh yeah exactly <clears throat> especially that I have programmed algorithms that take ticks into account, like one tick up or down makes a difference in decision making in that algorithm. Mm. And it is so precise that gives you, you know, uh, win rates of more than 70, 75%. So how can the market not be accurate? How can you have the concept of noise and be able to program the computer with that kind of accuracy? So uh, noise really doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I, I can prove it with coding, with programming that um, what Al says is actually completely correct. That's so interesting you say that because one thing that sticks out in my mind from my early days in Al's room is I used to, um, every time he said either I took this trade or I didn't take this trade, I'd write it down. And one time he said, this bar got one tick too big. And so I didn't take it. And it ended up being a failed breakout. 
And he was saying that bar just looked one tick too large. Had it been one tick smaller, I would have taken it. And that's the how much precision he needed. He needs to see. But you're doing it. Obviously, you're you're quantifying it. But for him, it seemed like it just didn't look exactly as he needed it to. And that shows that one tick can actually make a difference between a losing trade and a winning trade. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, and that's the difficulty for day trading because you have to have seen so many charts to understand those nuances hmm. and then see see those little things in the small amount of time that you have to yourself because um if you're day, day trading on let's say five minute charts by the time the bar closes you maybe have a second or less to place an order hmm. So you have to be watching that bar very intensely and expecting when it's going to be closing and make your decisions within a fraction of a second, really. Uh, right. It doesn't look that intensive when, you, when you're just sitting by and looking at the chart slowly forming bars. But in actual trading, you don't have much time. Yeah, and, and it's one thing to anticipate if you're anticipating a second entry then you know that if this bar is a second entry i can take it but what you're saying is even if it's a second entry um you have to watch it intensely because it could get too big it could get two ticks too big in the last 30 seconds or it could have a tail on top at the last two seconds and yeah. so if it does change you have to make a split second decision to either cancel the order or, yeah. or it looks like a breakout but it fails to actually close above the point that it makes it a breakout right those at that point close two ticks below that point mm. all of those things make make a difference mm. so yeah those things are all important and um so i want to i want to talk about for the aspiring trader uh you you mentioned in your article i'm going to link the article in uh, in the description for anyone who um, hasn't read it uh, but you talk about the spiral model of learning. Can you talk a bit about why that's relevant to trading and why you think that's most helpful <clears throat> to, to how we progress as traders? Uh, well, the reason is um, it shows in a graphical form what actually happens to a trader. You know, we have other models like Colby, for example, for, uh, for learning, which is um, kind of like a international reference for for these models but they mostly focus on how you learn okay um, for example they separate learners from um, visual learners to uh, tactile learners you know so so they categorize the learning population into different buckets right. and then they have prescriptions for each one of them so if you are for example a visual learner do these things and this is the process that you're going to go through to learn Sure. I mean, everybody learns somehow, but those models really do not explain what happens to you in your learning journey. They just tell you how you learn. Right. But this spiral model for trading is great because it shows you what actually happens to you in your learning journey. Because um, if you think about trading, all the concepts that you have to learn you know, and we are talking about spe uh, specifically price action trading. So we yeah. are not talking about quantitative methods, technical analysis, programming. Just forget about all of that. Right. Price action trading, everything that you need to learn is three or four books. Okay. Any intraday chart from any instrument has about 300 unique price structures like from open to close, if you want to characterize that day, what happened inside of that day, there are only 300 types. So multiply that by two, there are 600, so 300 for bull, 300 for bear. And then as far as nuances go, multiply that by four, okay? Or maybe five. So 600 times four is 2,400 uh, to 3,000. So if, if you have seen 3,000 uh, correctly classified charts and studied them, not just seen, studied, study means to sit down and think about it. Right. 
you have seen everything. So that's the scope of knowledge that you have to have for day trading. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and when you far, sorry, 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 I was gonna ask when you say when you say you've seen everything, you mean you've seen every concept, but not necessarily every iteration. Like they could be slightly different in structure, but you've seen the concept. Is that what you mean? No, you have seen everything. You have seen all okay. everything that the market can do every way in the intraday chart all the types and all the variations of um so we're going to come back to this later but just as far as the amount of knowledge goes this is your theoretical knowledge right okay? and it is far smaller than for example if you want to get a phd or something in something okay um to give you an example from my own experience um to get my network certifications and to keep it up to date for a period of about 15 years, I had to read 2000 pages of material every single year. Hmm. Okay. Um, new material, new material. Yeah. So um, there are 1000 pages to 2000 pages books, book after book that you have to read and learn to be able to become a network engineer. Hmm. And that goes on as long as you have that career because things gets changed and updated now compare that to trading um i have it i don't have it here with me but i can send it to you later i took a picture of my library at home with my price action books at the beginning of the row and all the network and computer books following it mm -hmm. so there's like these three books and as long as you can see there are books uh for, from different aspects of computer science so the amount of knowledge that you need to have for day trading is far smaller than any other scientific field, right? Which means trading is not science, it's mostly art. So there are other things that you have to work on. But your knowledge is limited. So what happens with learning is that you have this relatively small amount of knowledge that needs an art-like experience to implement um, in a high quality way, okay? So you start from this point, now you have all the knowledge. Let's say you sat down and like, like me, you know, locked yourself in a room and studied like mad all day. And now you have this knowledge, but you don't have that art-like experience. So you start from this point and start to build experience, but you rotate around this core knowledge of the, the same time. material over and over. Yeah. So you repeat everything that you know, but every time that you implement, you gain that experience in small amounts, but that spiral gets now bigger and goes up. So in every circle, you have more experience and that experience allows you to see more of those theoretical concepts all at the same time. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that everybody have experienced this, that you look at the chart where you're involved in day trading, and then at the end of the day, you sit there and look at the chart and say, gosh, I didn't saw that. There was a gap there. There was a breakout there. There was a failure there. This happened, that happened. I missed all of that. Hmm. So why, do, why does that happen? The reason is your, your experience is not enough at that point to give you full command or full perspective of everything all the theory that you know hmm. because your mind has to actively think about it right once the neural network is built then connections happen in your subconscious rather than in your active thinking hmm. and that makes seeing a lot of things possible at the same time effortlessly with a very short amount of time hmm. so your your eye becomes fast as soon as you look at the chart, you see everything in a glance. And that is not present. So you need those cycles of repetition to, to take that relatively small amount of knowledge into a and distribute it and enhance it with experience in your in the neural network that you're building your mind and take it down from the active level of thinking to subconscious level mm -hmm. so that once you see something it's immediate you know what's going on 
and there is no further analysis required. Things happen without you knowing. Mm. That's what you said. Like you see something and you cannot fully explain it, but you know that what the what the correct action is after you see it. That's because at that point you have uh, moved your knowledge from your active mind to your subconscious, and it's now fully integrated in that neural network that has the highest capacity for data processing in, in your in your brain. Hmm. And when you as you move through the cycles, is it an active process of constantly revisiting that core base of knowledge? Yes. Or is it you start here and then you just gain experience and trade and trade and trade no. and it happens automatically? Or do you have to keep diving back into that core base of knowledge? I think you have to go back to it long enough for you to um, effortlessly remember all the theory. Mm -hmm. Like put a chart in front of you, okay? A five minute chart of S&P for instance, and start talking and record your, uh, your voice. You have to tell the story of this chart from bar one to the end of the day. Mm -hmm. If it takes less than three hours to talk about all of it, you're probably missing something. True. All right. But if you can talk without stopping, like this is what happened here, this is what happened there, you know, especially if you can mask the chart and just talk about the last bar right. and talk about the possibilities of the next bar without seeing that bar, mm -hmm. then you're probably going to extend that conversation to well over four hours. That's the amount of information content in 81 bars intraday. Mm -hmm. So at any point, if you hesitate or, or you see that there is something that you missed or you don't know, you have to go back and take a look at the material, study that section, learn it actively, and um, I think the best way to really get a good handle on the theory is either to program a computer to read the chart. That will really enhance your understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second best thing is to, to teach. Yeah. You know, form a study really group with your friends, teach them. Right. Okay, awesome. Um, that's a really good explanation of that. I think that clarified, you mentioned it in the article, but. I think this clarifies it a lot for me. Um, okay, great. Also, I also really like, I really like the idea. I mean, I don't know anything about programming, but this is kind of inspiring to think because I, I do value learning by teaching, but after speaking with you right now, I, I think to be able to actually write it down and because what you're doing essentially when you're programming is you're writing it down and you're giving it to someone and saying, do this. But right now, yeah. I don't think I could give a friend a piece of paper and say, do this. I'd have to you be there. Give it to yourself. Say, no, this is not that. This is this is a nuance. This is a nuance. So yeah. to be able to program it means you're telling the computer, you're giving ownership to the computer and saying, this is exactly what is happening on every bar. And to be able to explain that must take an extremely deep understanding of the of the content. Yeah, it's uh, it's surprising how how much detail is in a price chart, mm. and uh, it really comes to it, it. Really surfaces when you start programming it, and you see that oh my god, mm. and um, it, it's it's a humbling experience in my opinion. <clears throat> um, but one of the other things that you can do, and I'm trying to find the PowerPoint here for you. Um, what I used to do was to take notes. And I did it in a flashcard format. So in PowerPoint, there's one slide for one concept. Hmm. And every time that I heard something in the trading room, I or you know, there was a chart that interested me, then I had to go back and read the books again to see, you know, what that thing is. I made the slide for it. And this was going on for, I don't know how many years, maybe five or six years, maybe more. Mm. Um, and it eventually ended up being this very bulky PowerPoint that has, um, let me open it and tell you. Yeah, take your time, no worries. It is 831 slides. 
probably as of today. Do you want to take a look at it? Yeah, hundred percent. Let's see it. This is that document, and if you look down here, it has eight hundred and thirty-one slides. Hmm. Um, so it starts with it's not very organized yeah. because it's flashcards, right? So you don't right. want it to be organized. Right. But I used to I made all of these slides every time that there was something interesting. Right. So for example, price versus time. Uh, reason to exit. Hmm. Breakout mode trading. Breakout mode trading trading range day example. Wow. Game on. So now when you um actually this is a good this is a good uh a good segue into in this into the bulk of this. When you when you notice something on the chart and you said you went and made this these flashcards, how does um how does that then become a part of your decision making process for the next time you see it? What do you once you make the flashcard, what do you do with that to make sure that either if you made a mistake, you don't make the same mistake again, or if you saw that it led to something significant, but you missed the trade and you put it in a flashcard and say, hey, if I see this, this is meaningful. How do you then implement that into practice and make sure that it it um, influences your decision making next time you see it? Well, that's a different aspect of learning, right? So you keep track of things um, in a document or in a journal. But the purpose of this is just to have all of these concepts that I had missed or was interesting to me after I had read the theory mm. um, so that I can go through them quickly and ask myself, I just by just looking at this title, do I remember this? Yes or no? Mm. If I don't, what was what is the content to um, to refresh my memory? But that, but this is different from the end of day analysis, right? So at the end of the day, you review your trading for that day, right? And you you find what are the things that you missed, and uh, go back to fix them. So that's right. a different process. The purpose for this document is to have everything in one place, every interesting thing for the learner who I am. Right. So this is not probably usable for others because this is Personal. something I did for my own learning. Right. And <clears throat> then, for example, on you know, at the during the weekend, I can sit here and go through the you know, hundred slides randomly and mm -hmm. then test myself to see if I remember all of those things or not. But then because it's a computer document, it's searchable. So at the end yeah. of the day, if there's a concept that I felt I missed and mm -hmm. I knew that I had a slide on it, it's a quick find. You just can search for it and find the concept. So now, so when you, when you notice something on the chart, how do you know if it's, flashcard worthy because i can see scenarios and I, I know for for many years when i was just learning i would make a i would make a slide and say when this happens this is a good sign for a breakout mm -hmm. but it's not it just led to a breakout on that day or on the last few times i that i had seen it so how do you see something and then say i'm going to make a slide on this because it's something worth rem remembering how do you know that it's actually a concept that is um that has value every concept has value it's just um where you are in your ex expertise building and <clears throat> to build um to build a skill set or new knowledge you also have to know how to learn right, right. so your study skills is the answer to this question mm -hmm. that comes partly from experience of your you know education high school university it comes from working in a job that's demanding, like uh, engineering, for instance. Right. Uh, you're you all constantly are learning. Every day on a job, you're learning something. So how do you keep track of that information flow and make it stick? Mm -hmm. So those are the study skills that you build as part of your education as you uh, go to school and learn things. And you use the same skills um, bring it to trading to learn now trading which will 
help you to organize the information, to keep track of your learning, to journal or not to journal, uh, how to create those slides, when to reference them. Mm -hmm. There is no really set method. It's just something very personal and depends on your study skills. Have you read Make It Stick? Since you mentioned Make It Stick, have you read it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a great book. I, I enjoyed it, um, and so I try to I try to implement some things from there. A lot of it based around constant testing. So I'll mm -hmm. take a chart and then I'll cover a, a, an area of it where I felt during the day I didn't I didn't have a good grasp of the probabilities or um, if I missed something, and then I'll I'll randomize it in a in a document and I'll pull it up randomly and test myself so that those concepts stick uh, for the next time. So that, yep. that was was a good source of information about how to actually learn properly and make things um, have things um, be solidified in, in memory. Yeah, there's also your personal traits. Like, for example, I am not a quick learner. Me either. Or I'm no, not. A quick I, it either. takes forever for me to learn something really well. Yeah. But I learn at the with a very high quality. Like, if if I know something, you would I would mm -hmm. never forget it. So for me, it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of writing. And because of that, I have to, I have to do it. I just know myself hmm. that I'm not, um, I'm not somebody who reads some things and learn it. I have to write it down and think about it and play with it to learn it. 100%, yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm just um, relaxed and open to it. That, okay, here we go again. I have to do this. It takes, you know, I don't know, 50 hours to get this done, down. Right. So let's work on the first of that 50 hours. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. I feel the same way. Um, I also feel like I'm biased towards depth and not breadth and for the same reason. Um, I, I like to go very deep. And because I like to go very deep, it takes me very long to learn maybe simple concepts because it, as soon as something enters my mind, it kind of forms its own connections everywhere. And I, I don't feel like I have an understanding of it until I've explored all of those. Correct. So it takes me a long time and that's why i feel like this journey has been so i, I feel personally it's been very long for me yeah. but i attribute that to to this quality we're talking about that I, I really need to understand it at a high quality um like you're mentioning yeah especially with trading if the quality is not there well you're not going to do good in, the, in yeah. your trading activities yeah exactly so I think let's let's table the binary decision tree until the next topic. I want to because we're talking about practice and and learning. I wanted to talk about deliberate practice. Okay, um, sure. So you mentioned deliberate practice in in your article. How can we? So can you briefly talk about deliberate practice? How is it different than than the the mindless repetitions of, of normal practice? And how does that apply to to trading? How can someone apply this concept of deliberate practice to their trading and their practice? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so the way I did it for myself was I used the Ninja Trader Market Replay as the tool for that deliberate practice. I would download days the data on, on Ninja Trader and start uh, playing playing it back. Not too fast, because if you play if you replay the market too fast, then it distorts your sense of time. 100%. So maybe three times the speed at most, um, and then focus on one technique at a time. For example, um, let, let's talk about something that's fairly simple, um, breakout trading. I see a breakout, how do I trade it? That requires you to first sit down and think about what you want to do, right? Hmm. And um, let me show you, because it's easier to, to show you what I mean. And just talking about it. Well, first of all, I think when you're identifying anything in trading, you have to know the probability of that thing. And I've studied this. Leg one, leg two is the highest probability setup in trading. The probability is actually above ninety percent. Is that above ninety percent given certain characteristics of it, or yeah, yeah, yeah. given certain characteristics of it, it's market moves the market makes these two-legged moves all the time so um it's the highest probability setup really but once you have this leg one odds of getting this leg two sometimes it's smaller than leg one but 
getting something of a leg two is more than 90%. Now, you have to characterize it. This is one of the ways to characterize it, to look for micro channels, okay? And find a method to quantify it. So this is that method, right? There are 10 qualities that quantifies a micro channel. So if you have all of them, that probability is very, very high. It's really above 90%. So if you if you go through this list down here, there, there are 10 characteristics for a micro channel. Do you see all of them? Yes, I see them all. Uh, yeah, I mean, when when you are trading um, during the during the trading hours or you're doing your practice, if your if your focus is breakouts, you have to go through this list. So the first step of the deliberate practice is to have a good foundation for what you want to do. The understanding that enables you to do something as a trader. Now, one of the things here is that if you read this page, I say knock off 5% probability for each missing strength factor. So these are the strength factors. Right. There are 10 of them. If you don't see any of these, you knock off 5% for each. Your, your probability is down to 50% now. Right. It's not 90% anymore. Mm, that makes but, sense. Yeah, but the more of these that you see, um, the higher the probability of that second leg up. And this is regardless of the context. Like you don't remember, you don't know anything about higher time frame context, what the market is doing now, why it is happening. You don't know any of that. You're mm -hmm. just thinking like a computer. You're just looking at that small piece of chart and trying to quantify it and look for a trade to, um, to participate in the outcome of that setup. So you have to have this. You have to spell it out very clearly for yourself, any, any concept that you are practicing. Then you start your practice session and try to follow the, the measurement techniques, the method that you have devised for your trading as closely as you can mm -hmm. and score yourself. Did I do everything correctly? Um, there, there's, a, there's a feedback loop, right? So you, mm -hmm. you start to trade and see if you are following the steps that you, you said you would do and how well you are following those steps. Are you jumping the gun? Are you not patient enough? Are you too slow to press the mouse button? And that builds the skill. But you focus on one area only. So for example, if I'm, if I'm practicing this chart, uh, there are a lot of different things that I can do. But if I'm focusing on this concept of breakouts mm -hmm. and second legs, yeah, that would be the only thing that I'm allowed to do in that practice session. That makes sense. So if I'm going to summarize what you're saying, the first step is, let's say, for example, there's one skill, which is breakouts. Mm -hmm. Within that major skill of breakouts, you're, are you specifying micro channel breakouts because you could have a trading range and a one bar breakout yes or, so you're saying first decide what you're working on mm -hmm. and then within that category a subcategory of breakouts right. in the form of micro channels and then before you can start practicing you have to understand that concept and that's what you've done here you've pretty much through your own research you've understood the micro channel and all the characteristics that make it strong once you know what you need to learn then you isolate that skill and go to a uh, market replay so that you can practice that specific skill and then grade yourself only on the execution of that skill. Yes. Is and then right? you add nuances, right? So that's the third step. This is just one chart. Can I trade this correctly mm -hmm. on 20 different charts? Mm -hmm. So every chart has a small nuance, like it's not exactly like the previous one. There are differences. So just because I replay one day and I'm doing everything correctly doesn't mean that I can do it on the next day and the next day. So the second or the third part is to now practice the same skill on different days that have different price structures and see if I can still do it correctly or not.
the way my mind works is um, a computer engineer's um, mind to, to program a computer. So I, I'm constantly thinking about everything as a small machine that has an input, a process, and an output. So the input is the price bars, price action. The process is everything that happens to that input to result an action, and the action is the output, right? Right. So to be able to, to decide, I, I would like to be able to draw a flow chart or a very clear set of steps that I would have to follow. And this goes for programming, right? So if, for example, if you're programming this in, in an algorithm to trade breakouts, this is exactly what you do. You have your measurement steps, there are 10 steps. Uh, you see whether the market is giving you these things and how, how many of them are given to you by, by that particular you know, setup. Mm -hmm. And then you score it and then you place a threshold for the computer that if it is above you know, certain percentage point, you, you can start buying, for example. And that's where the stock goes. Hmm. So, you know, at this point, if you're at any point in here, if you meet some of these criteria, you can start buying. Stop is down here and you're looking for a second leg up. Right. <clears throat> and you, you can further tune it into measuring how much the market moved against the setup, hmm. the adverse move. So now you have two reversal points and at adverse move and then when it starts to take off again you also have this point you can measure these two points and have an estimation for your exit target right so that's how you program a computer to trade micro channels same goes for for your own trading so I, this is this is how i think about it <clears throat> define the machine that you're operating if the machine is the micro channel machine the input is price action, the process are these steps, and the output is um, the, the decision that this is tradable first. And then the second decision is, okay, now how do I enter into this trade? The simplest way is to buy at the market and use a wide stop, right? So mm -hmm. it doesn't need any, any further thinking. But then you can take it like five notches up by adding uh, trade entry techniques, limit order entry techniques, all the, you know, other little things that you can add to make it more uh, robust. But those things also add to your decision making time. So they will increase your uh, practice time as well. For example, this, this breakout in the first blue box is very different from this one down here. Right. So this this one down here is far easier to trade than this one. Mm. But those are the, the the parts that you need to practice on the nuances to build the the experience the skill set really. Mm. But as far as what to do goes, um, I think the best way to look at it is the the way you program a computer. This is the input, this is the process, this is the output to my decision. And then if you have the decision, now am I going to allow myself some discretion, like delaying the entry, looking for second level setups to get me into the market at a more opportunistic price? Or it's going to be a simple implementation, just buy or sell at the market at that point. Mm -hmm. So for example, this is, this is about entry on the same concept. All right. Okay, so for example, here is four bars up. There's a gap here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the four prices, open, high, low, close, all of them are trending, right? Right. OHLC of this bar is entirely above this one. So every single price is above the next one, the prior one. Right. This low is above that low. This open is above this open. This close is above this close. This high is above that high. Right. So these two bars have no overlap, zero overlap between mm -hmm. these two bars. And then this one is also good. This one closed inside the range of the prior one. So if 
we go back to the prior list. If you look at this list, it doesn't have uniform bar sizes. It has most bars close on high. It mm -hmm. has micro gaps. It has tick gaps. It has every bar closes above the high of the prior bar, minus the last one. Right. Every low is above the prior low. Some opens are at or above the prior close, which was, if you remember that chart. Yeah. So it qualifies on most of these items, right? Right. So when, when that is the case, you can buy at the market. I no see. further decision is required because this is not a very high probability move. Mm. Same with this one, right? This one also qualifies in probably eight of those 10 categories. The only one it doesn't qualify is that this bar is smaller than the oh, two other bars. Right. So we don't have uniform size. We have mm -hmm. three good bars, but size are not uniform. But it still is good. So this maybe qualifies as an 80% uh, scale rather than 90. And this is 80% for a leg one, leg two, yeah. based on the, after the first, the first meaningful pullback? Uh, it might not even pull back. Hmm. So when so you're measuring the leg one, leg two without an obvious pullback, how are you measuring the, the first leg? Uh, that's not the criteria. The criteria is if I enter at this point in the market, hmm. um, am I going to get a move in my direction first before my stop gets hit? That's the criteria. Right. You can You can enter here and the market pulls back on the next bar, but your stop is up here. Right. So all that you need to know is if I enter at this point, what's the directional probability this way or this way? Directional probability is down right. at this point, even if it pulls back first. Right. So at this point, you want the market to go your way before it hits your stop. Right. That is the decision we are making. We are not thinking about trading the first pullback. That's a different uh, strategy. It's a different setup. Right. Breakout trading means if I have a breakout, the market might not pull back. Right. So I want to be short here and I want to be long there mm -hmm. and hope that the market will go my direction. And I know that because of that high probability, even if it pulls back first, it wouldn't reach my stop. Right. Okay. So that's the that is the decision that that is what we want out of them out of this trade same with this one so we have three good bars there's a micro gap here mm -hmm. uh, two of them are uniform size this one is slightly smaller open high low close all of them trending there's a tick gap here there's a one tick gap between these bars right um, so this qualifies in again about eight of those ten criteria so if I buy here, the market is going to go higher before it reaches my stop, right. which is what happened. Um, this one obviously failed, right? Right. And um, are you, is this, um, is there a threshold for when, how many bars it takes for it to be considered a micro channel? Because here there's a lot of examples of three bar micro channels. Is that enough as long as it meets those 10 criteria or some of those 10 criteria? Uh, there's a, there's a concept in, uh, in programming and in mathematical analysis. It's called finite vector analysis. Finite vector analysis says, what is the minimum amount of information you need to ex explain or describe a phenomenon? It's very relevant to trading because you don't want to lose out on the opportunity by giving the market too much time for information so that you can make a decision right um so by having your criteria as soon as you see 70 percent of them present you you can start trading that's mm -hmm. why you need three or four bars not more even maybe two bars but but trading based on two bars is not really a macro channel at that point right Something why different. The why is important always. You have to ask yourself, why is two bars not enough to, to label it as a micro channel? Well, because the first bar is the setup. 
sorry is the signal right the second bar is the trigger and the third <clears throat> bar is the follow through so you have this first bar here showing you that something is changing right the second bar shows that the change is happening so this actually this is the breakout that right. second bar is the breakout not the first right. bar and then you need one follow through bar that gives you three bars same mm. with here reversal so this changed the market bar three you need a breakout the breakout is small but there is a breakout because the close is below the low of bar three and then you need one more bar as your follow through bar that gives you the three bar sequence mm. uh, sometimes it's not very good like here so you have a reversal followed by a breakout but the follow through bar didn't close above the high of the prior bar so maybe right. you, you need one more bar to confirm this prior prior one but mm -hmm. at this point it's a buy so you will use the in, in every decision for trading especially day trading because there's a time crunch you rely on that finite finite um, vector analysis and you have to think about it what's the minimum amount of information that satisfies my inputs so that my process can start uh, working on it and gives me a decision hmm. that makes sense and so this is this a directional probability based on um your stop to your entry and is that when you say 90 percent, if all of them are there uh, when all the factors are present, is that 90% for a directional probability equal to the reward, a distance equal to the reward? Um, of getting a second second leg of some sort. It of might be sort. compressed. It might be smaller. If you have extremely high probability in your favor, you don't need a one-to-one -one payout for your strategy to be positive. Right. Okay. Um, you need a fractional payout. And that's the theory behind scalping, right? So you, your stop is always much bigger than your profit targets are. Now, um, if you use this for scalping, you are never going to get your uh, full risk back because you are out maybe one or two bars. So as soon as you see the market is um, faltering around the support level, you're going to close that trade right if not when you get this you have to close that trade right. but um if you are swing trading then you are going to have more losses uh, especially if you cannot manage that trade if you cannot scale in or do other things right but but the question here is really directional probability of getting that second leg and knowing that the second leg can sometimes be small and compressed, like bar 34 on this chart. Right. And sometimes it can be surprisingly big, like here. Hmm. So if you if you trade it in <clears throat> all of these different, uh, all of its different shapes and you know variations, um, overall you're going to be positive because some trades like this result in a loss you you sold here you have to exit above this bar right but some of them work better than you expected like this one right so this one pays for those ones like this that mm -hmm. really didn't uh pan out as as you expected right that makes sense so it's not when you're when you're buying or selling in these situations you're not putting a necessarily putting a profit target equal to the risk you're taking the trade because it meets your entry criteria and then you have some sort of separate exit criteria like exiting below a bear bar or exiting when you see something different uh, yeah there are some universal exits that you have to follow doesn't matter what you do um so here is for example the profit maximizing mm. exit uh, is that the correct one no sorry okay here this one so if you entered here on that breakout and you suddenly give it get a very big bar that pays for your risk yeah that's an exit right or you get you enter here and you get these big bars that 
immediately give you a big profit, you take that profit and close the position. So this is the profit maximizing exit, but for losses, um, different ways. So this is the minimal trade management. And minimal, what do you mean by minimal? Is that? Is um, that you, well, you use a very simple algorithm for your exit. For example, this one says simple exits reduces your trade management effort substantially and frees up your mind to focus on other important tasks. So mm -hmm. you just have a very simple algorithm for exit. And this is the algorithm. Standard exits, one tick below a strong bear reversal bar, mm -hmm. one scalp size below a bull bar. So there are only two rules in it, right? right. So and how, do you, how do you decide which one you want to use? Well, they are mutually exclusive, right? Right. Because this one is a bull bar, this one is a bear bar. No, no, sorry, I meant how do you know if you want to use a maximizing management strategy or a, a minimal strategy? Is that based on your own personality or is it based on the context or how do you decide that? Um, the profit maximizing exit is to take profits, right? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yes. This is this is to exit an open position because it's not working anymore. I see, I see, I see. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, if you bought this micro channel and you suddenly get this big bull bar, that's a profit maximizing exit. Right. Now there has been no pullbacks here, so maybe there's another entry here. But mm -hmm. if you buy again and then you get this bear bar, you have to exit below the low of this bear bar. It right. triggers the first rule, one tick below a strong bear reversal bar. Right. So it's not very strong because it's an inside bar, mm -hmm. but uh, you have to exit here. And then the next one is one scalp size below a bull bar. So here's a tight channel up, micro channel. And this green area is one scalp size below the last bull bar. Right. So that's that's the most amount of uh, space you're giving the market mm. and it and, hits your stop. And would you say that a trader, so what you have on the left side is exact rules based on um, your your entry. So would you say that a trader should have these set rules or yeah. would they, in, in this case, I won't exit below a bear bar because I think they might get a second leg up or uh, use their discretion to, to decide if this qualifies as a time to use a rule? Or should they have this list that you have here and, and follow it very strictly? Depends on where you are in your learning spiral. If you are at the higher levels, then you can use discretion. But mm. discretion is very dangerous when you are at the lower levels. Right. Because you don't know how to use discretion. Discretion does not mean you can do anything. Uh, in systematic trading, we have limitations for discretion, right? So you have your setup and trigger and trade entry and you give yourself maybe three options for your discretion but those options are known it's not like okay i'm going to watch the chart and see what happens that is not discretion discretion oh. is very defined mm. um, again following the same thought process you have an input you have a process and a decision based on that process now you can add sub processes to your main process but those sub processes that we label discretion, they are still defined, right? It's not like, okay, I'm gonna wait for the market to see what bar it gives me. No, it's not like that. Hmm. It's more like if I'm entering here, like for example, let's say we bought bar 12, goes right. on the high, all right? Uh, what is the discretion here? Well, First of all, I expect the market to go in my direction without hesitation. All right. right. That's that's the intention of this trade. Right. But what's the discretion? Okay, I can get I can get the bear inside bar, like what happened here, right? Bar 14. Mm -hmm. But if I get that bear inside bar, I'm allowed to hold on to it. Um because I expect the market to not go below the low of that bar, which is what happened on bar 15, right? It didn't right. go below the low of that. Right. Um, but, it, but if it reverses again for the second time, bar 16, 
then I'm going to be out. Right. So the discretion has very clear steps to it. Mm -hmm. And the more clarity you can bring to your own discretion, the better off you are, which means the less intuitive or the less discretionary you are, the sooner you're going to get to consistently profitable trading. Mm -hmm. So discretionary trading does not mean there is no definition for discretion. Everything is very clearly defined. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot think about those things, well, you got to go back to your flashcards, you got to go back to the books, you have to search for information, but you have to define your discretion. Discretion is bounded, it's not unbounded. Right, I think that's an important point. I think that discretion to, to a lot of people, and maybe including me at some points, is that you get to decide what you want to do on the fly but it's not that it's you have a you have a decision tree for all these scenarios and your discretion is to see what happens and then decide what did i already decide about if this happens if i get a bear right. bar after a strong bar then i'm going to hold because it may not trigger or, or whatever. yeah and then as you go on and become successful and hopefully more experienced then you add layers to it so for instance if you take this chart um, look here, this is a little piece of code that I wrote that uh, measures the opening gap, okay? Right. So on this day, the opening gap was 19 points. And then there's this marker, right? this uh, fat uh, marker here. Yeah. Uh, this shows that this gap is the largest gap of the, fa uh, of the past five big gap opens. Hmm. And then there's 100%. And that, that show, this 100% shows it's 100% of the daily range. Right. Of the past 21 days. Mm -hmm. So this little bit of information here, that changes my thinking about the entire day, even without having seen the rest of it. Because I know from my research that if you have a big gap op open, there is... <clears throat> more than 65% chance that you get a directional move in the direction of this gap, so gap up, leg up, in the first hour. The second uh, information item just from this gap size is 87% um, of the time, the day becomes a trading range day, which it was, right? Right. And then the third piece of information is that um, you get a pullback and a reversal, which we've got. And the fourth one is around 2 p.m., there's going to be an attempt to rally again. So this is 2 p.m. Right. right. That's, that's the attempt. Mm -hmm. It failed, and then the market reversed up. But I wouldn't sell at this point because I know uh, from my research that around 2 to 2.30, this, this time period, mm -hmm. these pullbacks happen and then both try to buy it. Right. So this is the layer that you add to everything else that you do in this day, including the breakouts and reading all the reversal patterns and everything, mm -hmm. because of the context information provided by this gap open, right? But to ask a beginner, to do everything correctly and have these things also added on top of it is asking too much. Mm -hmm. So for a beginner or a person with limited trading experience who is doing deliberate practice, you exclude everything from that deliberate practice. You just focus on that one pattern with very few discretion items and just try to do that as perfectly as possible in many different contexts, many different days. So you mm -hmm. see variations of the same setup. If you can do that for uh, maybe three setups, three different concepts, uh, you don't have to do anything else. That's enough to be consistently profitable. I'm, I'm very interested in your binary decision tree. So can you, can you show? Uh, yeah, sure, let's go to the... 
All right, so binary decision tree, right? <clears throat> so the first item in a binary decision tree is that we have two conditions in the market. We have a bear condition and we have a bull condition. Right. So the first decision is which, which of these two environments we are in right now. So the easiest way, the most painless way to determine this is just to look at the moving average. Uh, let's go to one of those charts that we have the moving average on so that it's easy to visualize this. Uh, let me find one. This one. Yeah, this one can do it. Price above moving average, it's more bullish than bearish. Right. Price below moving average, it's probably more bearish than bullish. Right. Price on the moving average with a flat moving average. Uh, I don't know. We need more information. Right. Which means trading range. Right. Price above moving average, and now the moving av average starts to tilt up. More bullish than bearish. Okay, so the first decision is bull or bear environment in our binary decision making. Right. Above bull, below bear on the moving average, wait for more information. Right. And going back to our decision tree now. So that's the that's the market um, re regime filter. Are, there, are we in a bear regime or a bull regime? That's always the first decision. Right. And then once we are in this environment, this point can be um I'm, I'm making this as i go right so the first one is the regime decision the second one is the behavior decision which is um are we in a trend or a trading range so trend trading range right so or one is maybe trend zero is trading range okay so we are in a trading range for instance are we in an up leg or a down leg hmm. okay for example down leg so, this right, so we're, we're already above the moving average we're in a trading range environment yeah and now we're on to the next the third the binary decision correct yeah. and then okay we are in a down leg are we near the bottom of the range or not yes or no hmm. okay so we are near the let's say we are not near the bottom of the range um can I can I go with the leg? Yes or no? So if, for example, we are reversing from the top of a trading range, we are in a bare leg above the moving average. If there is a, enough distance to support, which is the moving average itself, or the bottom of the trading range, and the signal looks good, maybe I can short for a scalp. But the other thing is that you don't want this to get very deep, right? Right. These are called um, Ordered binary decision trees, OBDT. And with these OBDTs, you really don't want to have many, many, many layers here. Mm -hmm. So maybe five or six uh, is the most. You, you can say the first one doesn't count because it's a environment switching decision, bear or bull. Right. But once you get to your first point in that uh, market regime, then you probably don't want more than uh, four or five down here. Right. Because then it gets too long to make a decision. Okay. But as far as you know, seeing, uh, seeing an actual one, yeah, here's one. So the breakout process, for example, the flow chart uh, for the breakout process. So you have a new bar on the chart and it looks like it's a breakout bar. We'll call it, we're going to call it NBB, new breakout bar. Right. And then the next bar forms, your immediate decision is, is it pulling back or not? Okay. So if it is not pulling back, it becomes a breakout gap. And then you wait for the next bar. So this loop constantly continues as long as the breakout is progressing because you're getting new bars and the new bar is not pulling back, it's just going higher and higher. Right. All right. Now, if, if the bar is pulling back, 
your next decision is is it a breakout test or not okay right. or if it is a breakout test is it a fail or a success hmm. if it is a fail new nbb new breakout bar is a measuring gap why because think about a breakout so there was a breakout went higher came back down didn't reach that breakout point so there's right. a gap in here now right so if the breakout test fails it starts to go up right. new leg in the direction of the breakout if it is a success it means the breakout gap closed nbb is an exhaustion gap this part that we are thinking about mm -hmm. the pullback is not considered a new breakout and it is a breakout gap itself yes, and one more leg in the direction of the breakout down or sideways is ex expected right so you at any point you just have one or two decisions this success fail mm -hmm. yes no but you have to sit down and do this in detail for everything that you're uh, intending to trade right and these are things that you have to have written down in detail and yeah. then practiced so that they actually you can actually work through it as right. you see it during the day uh, actually you do it in your deliberate practice first right so uh going back to what i showed you so the first step is concept definition you define your concept right all right once you have that clearly defined and clarity is for you you know you have to understand it right um so you have this then you decide on how you make these decisions you write it down and make it more uh close to the concept itself like this is for a breakout there's another very old slide that i did years ago for breakouts oh, this wow. is more complex but mm -hmm. Uh, at any point, you just have two decisions, right? Right. We, we don't we don't have one of these diamonds with three arrows going out. Mm. There's one input and two outputs. One input and two outputs. So you make your decision tree, and then you uh, look at the charts and find as many as you think it's appropriate. 10, 10 days, twenty days doesn't matter. It depends on. How, many, how much practice you want to get right load them up into your simulator and put your documents in front of you because initially uh, they are probably not memorized yet so you have to have a visual reference mm -hmm. and then start trading it and um, explore the feelings that come up um, do, do you do you see roadblocks in your execution uh, there's a bit of psychology here. If if you are trying to start a new trade and you feel unhappy about that setup, you are going to mess it up. Hmm. So happiness is an enabler in trading. And um, the best way to get it is through lots of practice so that you know, once I see this, I know the probabilities, then you feel happy and excited about taking that trade. Right. So your subconscious mind wouldn't come to your rescue to prevent you from taking that trade. Mm. Because if you are doing something that's going to hurt you, your self-preservation, -preserv your, your subconscious mind is going to come to your rescue and prevent you from taking that action. And in trading, it will result in delays, missing trades, screwing up the trade management, uh, hanging on to losers longer than necessary, all of the all of those things. Right. But if you if you feel happy and excited about the thing that you're going to trade and you have really clearly clarified it for yourself, as I showed you, by having a very well thought out and documented process for for your actions. Mm -hmm then there is going to be no fear. And that happiness allows you to not get tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. So you have all your mental resources available for your actions, for your trading, and it will eventually lead to a successful trading.
Awesome. Okay. Um, can you, is there anything that you'd want to say to aspiring traders who are either struggling or still on the journey? Is there anything like words of wisdom from your experience getting through it um, that you think would be helpful? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> people constantly talk, uh, ask about how long is this going to take? Mm -hmm. I don't know, forever. Time is not a factor here. <laughs> It's a career decision that can be life changing. And there is there is no way to really estimate the time. It's very personal. Everybody is different. Um, but you have to do the things that you have to do, which means sitting at a computer and doing nothing is not working on this project. And that, that's a hazard like people sit there and look at the charts and think that they are learning something it's not learning is an active thing you should get tired at at the end of the hour you, you can't sustain it more than two hours if you are not getting tired after two hours you're not really actively learning so <clears throat> don't put any time time on it don't restrain yourself financially because this is going to take a long time and it might be longer than you think um and just try to do two or three very simple things the the simpler the better but do those two or three things very very well and that should be enough um the the correct way of thinking about trading is to think about it as a factory owner okay that manufactures the a widget whatever it is you just need to manufacture one widget that sells to be successful you don't need anything else which means in in the con context of trading if you look at any setup as a product that you're pre manufacturing um you just have to manufacture high quality products but of one model you don't need 10 models so there is just one thing that you do for example the micro channels that we talked about today that's enough happens maybe three or four times a day so you have three or four opportunities to trade that setup um, and then once that product is perfect and it is now producing some revenue you can move on to <clears throat> engineer and build the next product mm. which could be maybe a pullback okay but basically, you don't have to do much. The less you do, the better off you're, you're going to be. But you have to do it well and have a business mentality behind it. You know, I'm producing a set of products, and these are my products. This is the manufacturing process for it, all the decision trees and things that we talked about. And I know that there's going to be some defects, and those are the losing trades. So this might help remove some of those emotions, but don't put any time and financial restraints on it because it's going to um, probably burden you too much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. My uh, pleasure. It was really inspiring. I love I loved uh, this conversation. Um, so I really appreciate your time. Um, My I'm, pleasure. Going to, I'm going to uh, I'll email you once uh, once we're done here. Um, okay. And I'll let you know once it's up and everything, but I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. My pleasure.